Monday, August 13th, 2012, uh, regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Can we have the roll call? Chairman Lennon? Here. Councilor Guvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, town Council reports and correspondence. Okay. I should have mentioned this at last month's uh, Town Council meeting, but I had the pleasure of attending the annual meeting of Eco Maine, at which time our very own Michael McGovern was elected president of the Board of Directors. Uh, and uh, Mike is so uh, well respected in that organization, it's just a real pleasure for me to see him in action in another venue. So uh, that's great for Eco Maine, and it's great for the town of Cape Elizabeth, as well as all the other member communities. Congratulations. Thank you. Jessica? Yes, um, several um, uh, items and news, and a little news about the library. The summer concert series continues. Last month, Tricky Bridges played on the uh, lawn to the delight of 175 people. Tomorrow night, uh, Jackson Gilman, a comedian, will be there 6.30 to 7.30, and the series continues uh, through August. Um, as a reminder, there are ongoing tours in the library through October, uh, organized by the Board of Trustees for anyone who wants to see what the needs are. And, <clears throat> and neighborhood coffees are beginning the end of August are being scheduled throughout town. Um, for more information on any of these, you can check the library website or contact Jay Sherman, the library director, or myself. Thank you. Any other? I'd just like to remind uh, anyone listening that um, there are some seats open on both the town council and the school board coming up this fall. Um, so if you're interested, and we hope you are, nominating papers are due um, at the town clerk's office on Friday, September 7th. By 4 p.m.? Mm -hmm. By 4 p.m. So please think about running. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we need fresh blood. Excuse me. Dave? Uh, just two other quick items. Uh, it, I think it's been a really exciting summer for the town, uh, watching the progress of the Shore Road Pathway. I, among many others in town, have been able to use it already, and it's just a great addition. Also, I had the pleasure of uh, participating, I'm not going to say running, but participating in the Beach to Beacon uh, a few Saturdays ago, and it is just in in incredibly impressive what a great event that is and how well run it is. Uh, so I want to thank all the <clears throat> local race organizers, the volunteers, and the uh, people cheering on the runners for doing such a great job. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any citizens here who wish to speak to items not on the agenda, so we will skip that and keep going. Town manager's report? Yes, thanks, Sarah. I did want to have a brief report this evening. I want to follow up a little bit on uh, Jessica, Councilor Sullivan, talking about the library. Uh, she mentioned a couple of programs. I actually counted earlier today. In August, which is usually looked at as a month when not a whole lot happens, you know, at, least, at least in Maine, there's a sense people take vacation. There's 40 different activities at the library this month. Uh, from, you know, uh, everything from Tales for Tots to Mother Goose Time to all those events that you mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the, the one that, uh, you know, puppet workshops. Uh, the evening West African Rhythm and Songs. I don't know if you mentioned that one. No, I didn't. And yeah. That's, that's uh, uh, hang on. I'll just yeah, on the 21st, but yeah. yeah. August 20th. Barbershop Harmonies on the 28th. And, you know, it just, you know, and I, and I go back to, you know, Dave, Dave mentioned the shore, shore Road Path. We keep getting comments all the time in that, oh, the Shore Road Path is so much better than I thought it would be. Uh, you know, I, I never knew that the, you know, <coughs> You know, I, I thought this was going to be terrible. I really like it. And these are folks that are coming up saying they were opposed to it. And I can't help but think of the analogy with the library. Mm -hmm. uh, in that, you know, right now we're going through a stretch, stretch with the library. A lot of people are questioning, you know, what is it they really want to do? And, you know, what's this going to cost? And, you know, it, it, you can't compare everything just the same. But, you know, 
there's also a vision that people have worked on almost at almost the exact same period of time as when the Shore Road Pathway started that the library started. So, you know, I, I think, you know, people have given Shore Road Pathway a second look now, now that it's under construction. And, and I really hope that folks do look, do take advantage of those library tours that you mentioned, Jessica, and, you know, give, you know, look beyond just the headline of, of, or the one-liner uh, on the project and consider whether or not uh, it's appropriate because, you know, it, it, there is an opportunity here in November to consider the needs of the library. And, you know, if, if, it, is a, if it is not decided to go forward, uh, then, you know, this, that has a whole, whole other cor uh, uh, cascade of issues and, and how do you deal with it. And, you know, I think it is quite a bit akin to the Shore Road Pathway that, you know, once people see it and the potential, it goes back to why I've encouraged people to go look at new libraries in other communities. When they see the difference, when they see those libraries, I, I think that they could get more excited about what, what Cape Elizabeth uh, could have for a public library. Yes, and I, I um, actually was at a, a noon meeting uh, concerning the library today, and again, the subject came up of the fact that we average 1,600 visits a week, and these are all ages, you know, toddlers coming in for reading programs, elderly people coming in to read the Wall Street Journal, I mean, people coming in to pick up books, people coming in to use a computer, so, you know, it does meet the needs of a lot of our citizens. 35,000 interlibrary loans a year out of the library. We, we didn't plan this, yeah. so, you know. <laughs> Anyway, end, end of commercial. Uh, Mike, Michael, just to, to, to um, underscore some of what you're talking about, I mean, it is interesting with the, with the shore path and um, to, to think that about the number of man hours that have gone into the work that went on behind the scenes. I mean, the number of citizen volunteers who put their time and talent in to bringing that to where it is. The same thing in the library. No matter where you go in this town, we have folks who are willing to step up and put the time in. And, uh, and having a little trust in their vision and being able to see it come to pass is pretty neat. Um, you know, I mean, I, I ride my bike down there now um, more than I've ever because I'm so curious about it on a daily basis. Um, but I, I have to tell you that my hat's off to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, especially those that are willing to volunteer their time to make these things happen because it doesn't happen by the town manager or it doesn't happen by the, the town council by itself. It's, it's really a community effort and, uh, and it really speaks to the core values that we in Cape Elizabeth all have. This is a great place to live and we want to continue that for future generations. Which, you know, you'd think this was orchestrated. My, my, my notes in, in red ink, which I don't even have the red pen with me, uh, the, the next thing I actually wanted to talk about was volunteers. And I also was thinking about it over the weekend. The, the Beach to Beacon, all organized by the Beach to Beacon organization, had over 600 volunteers. Pretty neat. The Portland, if you look at Portland Headlight, the library, if you, if you add in the Shore Road Pathway, about another 100 volunteers, were, you know, that's the, the result. Those things are the result of over 100 volunteers. Mm -hmm. The Arboretum first phase was dedicated if one, one day last week, 300 volunteers have worked on some a aspect of that operator. So you just add just those things, a thousand volunteers. It's incredible. You know, and some of them may be the same people working on each one, but over a thousand volunteers have worked on the Arboretum, the Beach to Beacon race this year, or, or Portland Headlight the, or the library or yeah. the, the volunteers were mentioned, Shore Road Path. You know, pretty amazing. Uh, the other things I wanted to mention, uh, the Shore Road Path is going well. Uh, no surprises on the finances. Uh, working very well with all the neighbors and appreciate that. And I think the, the, the single out, I could single out a lot of different folks. I, I want to single out the flaggers. Uh, I've gone through a lot of construction projects and they, they seem to really be doing an, an outstanding job. Uh, Riverside Stone Wall, if any of you haven't been down that end of town, oh, great. Uh, that was something the council really wanted to have happen. Uh, Bob Malley worked, got the bids out, and uh, it's really looking good. And I think, again, shows the importance of the whole concept of the gateway into the community and, and uh, having something when people look at, you know, they're not, they're not embarrassed when they go over the line, that they see the town hall, town line sign, and uh, you know, they can be proud of where they live. 
the town hall similarly is, is starting to shape up. You might have noticed a lot of equipment around here. Greg has been working with PM Construction, is that, is that the name? Uh, Greg Miles, the facilities manager. And over the next two weeks, the whole building will be painted again and, you know, should really be a lot brighter and sharper and a lot of the, the wood's being replaced, some of the windows being fixed, and that's uh, very positive. At the same time, a lot of rotted wood being replaced at the community center, some, some work at one of the fire stations, the, one of the buildings down at uh, the fort, uh, the larger the officers' row buildings, you might have seen equipment there, again, fixing the eaves so that those buildings are safe. The fire, the old fire station is having the lintels replaced in the next few weeks. And, you know, the council had asked, I think, two years ago, maybe now two years ago, that we really look at maintaining, that we try to find a way to maintain our buildings and facilities better than we have, and you, you put some resources into that, and I think we're, we're beginning to see some results of that. Uh, same thing, last year you invested in trail work. Uh, you, you authorized a new part-time summer position, and the Conservation Commission's going on a tour uh, coming up in the next day or two? Tomorrow. 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 Uh, to look at one of the trails to see see the work that that's uh, gone on. Um, yes, Mike. That actually, and I should have mentioned that that's 5:30 tomorrow, and it's the Two Lights Trail. Okay, so the, walk. And so that would be a chance if anyone wants to see the work that's been done there. The one final thing I wanted to mention: the Planning Board has started work on the reviewing the subdivision ordinance, and what, as they've begun to do it, you know, the the charge to them was. To, do, to look at technical issues, to bring the, the subdivision ordinance into conformance with the last comprehensive plan and make sure that the statutory references are, are right and that sort of thing. What they've found as they've begun to work on that is the construction of the ordinance itself, the way it's formatted, some of those issues could also need some improvement or enhancement. I've taken the position that that, that is part of a technical you know, technical change, it's, it's not substantive, it's not really changing policy. And there's, there seemed to be some hesitancy on, on, you know, at least talking to Maureen, you know, secondhand, that maybe the council hadn't authorized that sort of work and that you were limited to technical. And I just wanted to point that out, and you, know, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but my sense is you'd like a product back that's usable, func that functions well, easy to read, easy to follow. and. Uh, I don't believe that requires additional council authorization from what you've already authorized. I th my sense is that's your expectation. Right. Okay. Good. Tell them. Thank you. Thank you. For okay. doing our work. Next question. Uh, Mike, I've seen the work on the, um, the town hall reminded me of the um, capital plan study that we had yep. authorized in June in terms of looking at municipal yep. facilities as well as a variety of other things in town. I'm curious how, that, how that's going and what the deadline is or not, when we yeah. expect to get a report on it. Greg's been managing that process. We expect to report within a month, the end, the end of the end, next month. End of the month, we're supposed to get the draft results and then about mid-September, the final um, report. Yeah. We also are working with the same consultant to look at particularly this room and to see how we can make this function better so people can hear, so that the council doesn't seem as though it's up and raised, you know, uh, so that, that's ongoing as well. Thank you, Mike. Uh, review of draft minutes from July 9th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Any changes or corrections or anything? All those in favor? Okay, item 113, the, number, the November 2012 election warrant. Deborah, can you, do you want to speak to that before we? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, before you, you have the warrant for the Tuesday, November 6 municipal election. As Chairman Lennon mentioned earlier, there are three uh, members of the town council for three-year terms up, and also three members of the school board, all for three-year terms as well. Also on that, um, that you looked at at a previous meeting is the citizen vote on the proposed library project. That will also be on the um, local ballot. The polls, as always, will be at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And we'll be processing absentee balloting and accepting new registrations and corrections to the voter list. And this would be in order for your signature this evening. Right. 
Thank you. When does absentee, three weeks before? Uh, about a month before. It'll probably be early October. We'll have that information all on the website as soon as uh, they're available. Thank you. Jim? Sir, just, uh, Deb, uh, you didn't state the uh, possible charter change. Oh, also excuse on that. me. Yeah, you would. Yes. The library vote and the proposed charter amendment, uh, again, which was uh, spoke approved at your previous meeting, the last meeting. Thank you. Good. That's on there as yeah, well. That's on there. And a sample of this ballot and all the questions, state and federal, at some point shows up on our website yes. for people. Yes. Okay. Is there a motion? Jim? Um, I move that the town council approve the 2012 election warrant as reported by the assistant town manager. I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Item 114, update on rescue service. Peter, do you want to walk us through? Good evening. I'll just do a, a quick brief re recap, Kevin, on the uh, rescue program at this point. Um, last year, we, as part of the budget process, we approached the council to uh, address staffing concerns or response concerns of the rescue unit during the daytime, and uh, we we're able to secure funding to put in one ALS provider paramedic during the day. That person has been on board, or it's actually nine people we're using since January 1st. Um, the issues that we were seeking to, cons to address with the response time, the availability of, an, of a paramedic during the day, and also uh, relying on just a few people to cover those daytime calls. Uh, and We've been very successful. We have a great group. The thing that I think it's helped make it work is all of them were members of the existing unit. That we haven't brought anybody in from the outside yet, so it's people that knew the other members and worked well with the system. Um, some of the high points of the program is before the implementation of the program, our average response to get the ambulance on scene for all calls was about 10 minutes. We are now, during the daytime, we're down to about five minutes for the average call. So that, that's a significant change. And even um, for all hours of the day, all 24-hour period, where our ambulance is on scene three minutes sooner than it was before. So uh, I think that's, that's worked out very, very well for us. Um, so far this year, we've had 28 simultaneous rescue calls, which definitely, particularly during the day, used to pose us a problem. We've handled all of those without relying on mutual aid. We have had mutual aid. It's been used when it's intended to, is when our resources have been all used up uh, a couple times during structure fires. Uh, Out-of-town ambulances covered calls, or when both our ambulances were at the hospital, they covered calls. And we've only done, I think, three paramedic intercepts, where we had 20-some-odd last year. Uh, even the hours outside the per diem program, sometimes we just don't have a paramedic available, and we rely on cell phone to provide that coverage for us. But we've only done it three times so far this year. Um, we've done covered 310 calls for the first six months, and we're actually up to about 380 right now. Last year, we only had 492 total rescue calls, so with four and a half months to go, we're going to exceed that easily. Oh, I don't have any reason to explain that. It's just been very busy. You know, in January, we usually did about 25 calls, and we had 55 this January, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I have no rhyme or reason why, but we're averaging almost two rescue calls a day now. I think one of the important things to remember is the per diem program is great, and it's working very well, but there's still 15 hours of the day that are being covered by a very strong and, and uh, um, uh, there's a, just a great group of people that are covering those other 15 hours of the day. Um, you know, they, they get up, they have a night duty every, every seventh night they're on, uh, but only about 15% of our calls are during that time frame, which is great. But you know, I just think the program is a very successful at this point, but I still want to diminish from the volunteers that are still covering the majority of the calls. Even during the daytime when we had that per diem on, we're still getting three or four rescue members per call. So it, it's, it's worked out very well. What it enables us to do is if it's not a call of serious nature, we can keep that paramedic in town and send the regular volunteers in with the ambulance. So that gives us that ability to respond quickly to that next call, which happens more frequently now. So overall, I think it's been a great program. I think it, it, you know, it has certainly addressed the concerns that we had, and that I had and the council had. And I think we're well on our way of you know, keeping this a viable volunteer unit. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Jim? A couple of questions, Peter. Um, the you mentioned in here that while the five-minute uh, current uh, response time is a marketable improvement, you state that usually the police are the first ones there. 
So this is a five minute for the actual truck to the be the actual there. truck. Yes. And you mentioned that police are generally certified at a all of them are all of them are EMT basics. EMT basics. It's three the, levels of, of of EMS license in Maine: okay. the EMT basic, the e, uh, intermediate, which can do some intravenous therapy and okay. can do an EKG, and then you move on to the paramedic, which can administer the full range of drugs okay. and treatments. All right. And then the second question is about mutual aid. It's indicated here that you're not having to call upon mutual aid, which is which is good, I guess, in, at one level. Do we pay for mutual aid, or is it a sort of a, how does that work? If they, if they transport, they bill the patient. If it's a paramedic intercept, they bill us. If, if all they bring is a paramedic and it goes on our truck, sure. then, then they bill us for that service. Okay. But we, in turn, bill the patient, so it's, it's revenue neutral. And are we providing, because of the additional services, we're, are we providing a better mutual aid, if you will, to our neighboring communities? Yeah, we've actually been in Portland. We've been sent from the hospital in Portland to um, three calls in the city of Portland this year, which we, we hadn't done the entire time and been chief. And part of that is that it's a regional dispatch center, so that yep. dispatcher can see the ambulances that are available in the three communities. So they send the closest one sometimes. So we'll respond from the hospital a couple of times. Okay, thank you. Frank, and then Mike. Uh, Pete, the increase in volume, is it concentrated in any particular type of emergency situation or is it dispersed right across? No, we looked at it, you know, we split it between, the town is divided into two districts for us. It's e almost evenly matched between the two districts. Yeah, it's geographic districts. Geographic areas, it's, it's not, you know, time of day is, the majority of the calls are during the daytime, but, you know, it's not a specific, it's not like we're going to Cape Memory, Carroll Odd, or Village Crossing, we, we're going all across the community. Accidents. I mean, Accidents, um, every, everything you can think of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike? Just two quick questions. Uh, which, uh, how has it affected the morale amongst the, the rest of the rescue personnel? And secondly, what percentage of these new per diem folks were affiliated with the rescue, were sort of our rescue volunteers before? All of them were part of the unit before we implemented the per diem program, and one has actually moved up from being an intermediate to a paramedic since we have implemented the program. And I really, to be honest with you, I haven't seen any change in the morale. I think a lot of people have enjoyed having that ALS provider there and knowing that that person is there. Um, we're still, like I said, we're covering all our calls, which is an indication of how strong the morale is in the unit. So, so we didn't really hire outsiders. Not yet. We hired existing people already affiliated with the rescue unit yep. too. Yeah, and we have so far, positions. we have not had a shift uncovered. Uh, they sign up, I usually do it like the third Monday of the month, I'll fill out the schedule and they sign up prior to that. We have not had a day that has not been covered because being per diem employees, obviously, we can't force them to work. So, and so far in seven months of scheduling, we haven't had a day that it wasn't covered. Jim? Um, do we reimburse the, the three levels? The, if you're at a second level and you want to be a paramedic, do we reimburse the educational components? We do. The, the, the struggle now, Jim, is that to be, become a paramedic, if you're just an EMT basic, it's a two-year program at SMCC, and you don't really see a lot of people doing that to become part of a volunteer unit. They're looking to be employed as their main you know, source of income. Okay. So all, all of our per diems have other jobs, and this isn't their main source of income. So, yeah. But do we support it in any way? We do support it, but I, did, I think over the years you've seen diminishing numbers of volunteers going to become paramedics, at least in this area. Okay. Paramedic, it's, it's a two-year program at SMCC, and it's, yeah. you know, it's lengthy. That's a long time. Just, could you just review um, the uncovered shift calls? I, I think you might have mentioned this, but are those all t usually taken care of by mutual aid, but recently we've been able to cover no, them we, ourselves? No, we, we, we've been covering them ourselves. It's just that, probably just uh, you know, that, that second call has always been, has been an issue for us in the past couple of years, and we haven't, we've always been able to roll our second truck, which in the past was sometimes an issue. Any other questions? Peter, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion? Jessica? I'm sorry. Caitlin? Motion to accept, I guess. Would that be the update? Mm -hmm. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 115, the library internet policy. Uh, the trustees have recommended several changes to the library internet policy, and it's recommended we approve. Is there a motion? Frank? 
A motion to uh, accept this proposal for approval. I'll, I'll second. Any discussion? Right. Has there been a problem that spurred this um, change? No, it's the the Main State Library network receives federal E-rate monies, and the Main State Library folks told Jay that we were we, we were following all the talking points of the law, but they, he suggested some minor editorial changes to convey full compliance. Basically, what this does it clarifies that all internet content is filtered on every machine and that adults may legitimately request the removal of filters. That's the basic change. So. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? Item 116, proposed demolition of 7 Holman Road. Mike, do you want to set this up? I will, and Greg's here to answer any questions. Um, you know, we've been looking at the library needs, and I, I call it a little bit of a dilemma. What do, you, what do you invest in that property when you're hoping you're going to be replacing it? And, you know, I think Greg and I have talked about it. We want to do the, the, the minimal maintenance that provides for safety, a little bit of aesthetic, because even if, if, the council, if the citizens authorize this, we're still probably a couple of years away from that we still need to use this building. So we've come up with some minor safety improvements, but, but the, the one that really came up was, you know, at some point we're going to need to take care of uh, Holman, the Holman Road property. It's, uh, right now it's empty, it's uh, potentially could have some issues and problems, uh, has had a few, which I, which I really don't want to go into, uh, and, you know, it's a potential fire hazard as well. Uh, there, there's no way that the building is in shape that we, we wouldn't be investing, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand to put it back, you know, so that it was that it was habitable. Uh, we've already I've already authorized about three thousand dollars to remove asbestos out of it, and this is uh, I, I've asked fifteen thousand fourteen five was the proposal that came back. Uh, we got a couple of proposals to actually tear it down, and this would, if the council authorized this, it would happen when, Greg. The asbestos comes out. The asbestos comes out. Uh, Peter's also asked if he can have a window in there to do some additional training yeah. for his firefighters, which we can take care of on the phone whatsoever. What? How is that connected to the house? They want to do some uh, interior fire training. Burn it down. Several years ago, didn't we? Didn't this house? Didn't, wasn't it burnt down right across the street from the town hall here, and they used it as a training exercise? Yeah, that was a complete. Yeah, yeah, burned all of it. Is that a possibility for this? No, I, I've discussed that, and it's it's uh, we, we would do interior room burns, smoke, sure. dealing with smoke, burning the entire building. It's just it's too close to the to the back end of the library to risk sure. uh, the roof catching fire or. God forbid, you know, and even the smoke issues that in that, that tight surroundings. Yeah, what Peter's asked for is to be able to do some roof cuts for, for roof penetrations and things like that through the building. Some very, very controlled limited burns inside of the building. But there is a concern if we just try to burn the building down. We have the library right there. We also have some residential properties that are right near there that that could be impacted and we and it's not something that we would like to go down that road. So, Greg, 15,000 gets rid of everything. It does. We're just going to be looking at an empty piece of dirt. It's, it's a filled piece of ground. That's it. And my question, where does all that stuff go? Well, we're required uh, to, as part of this bid process, is to make sure that it is handled in a, by a licensed demolition contractor who disposes of the materials through a process through the DEP and the EPA so that any kind of hazardous materials, anything like that, is properly separated and tracked. We also obtain a chain of custody so that if it ever was brought back to us, we can say this is where this went and this is where this went. So that it protects Cape Elizabeth. Are there places that take brick and lumber and all the things that make up a house? And do you reuse it or do they burn it or do, what, what happens? It actually varies. Um, in some cases, to give you an example, like brick and block, um, there's a company right in Scarborough that grinds that up, adds it to a gravel base, and it's what's called reclaimed uh, material, and they use that for 
subsurface compacted materials, base materials for roads and walkways and things like that. Uh, some of the wood, depending, we'll, of course our wood is demolition wood, so it usually gets ground up um, and uh, turned into a product that is used for, in some cases, pellet, bur pellet compression. Because it is demolition wood, there are some limits because you can't ensure the cleanliness of the wood. It's not a brand new piece of wood or a brand new tree that has been cut down. So we, we protect that piece to Cape Elizabeth to make sure that we, it is handled in a manner that won't come back to us. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I just wanted to <clears throat> confirm with uh, Mike that my understanding that we are not able to insure this building. Isn't that correct? We have it insured. We, we don't have full insurance on it. We're only allowed a minimal amount of insurance on any vacant building. That's because it's not occupied. If it's not occupied, yeah. Frank. Um, two questions. When the building was originally, the lot in the building was originally purchased, what was the intention? And second, um, if the library is turned down, we're, we're saying effectively that there's no, no use for this building, even if the library rebuild is turned down. <coughs> It was built solely for space for the library lot to square off the lot. Just bought, lot. not built. Hmm? Bought, you mean. We have been purchased it solely for the purpose of squaring off the library lot. Okay. And so if the library is not uh, approved, new library is not approved, there's no, no use for that building anyway. There's, yeah, the, we, we've considered, you know, could the building be used, you know, in some other way, and the response it, it keep, has come back to no. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't built to you know, to be a temporary library, to store books, to any of those things. Okay. Will, will this building show up on this capital needs plan that you're coming up with? No, this building No, will this be is not on. surveyed. Well, if, if you authorize it. But if we don't authorize it, will it be showing up on that report? It, it won't because we didn't include it as part of the scope of services. Okay. All right. Just curious. And at one time, we were discussing the possibility of a historic society going in there. Is that a pipe dream, or is that history in terms of? I, I think it's not or, up to. I don't think it's fit enough. It has a lot of needs saying. internally: uh, heating so needs, expensive. electrical needs, water needs. Yeah. Um, the there is asbestos in the facility that has to be removed, which is below some secondary subfloors, the attic is insulated with asbestos, so that all has to come out, which then would mean we'd have to put all new flooring in, new subflooring, all re-insulated, needs a new heating plant, it needs considerable uh, updates. Publicly to accessible property. restrooms. So it's cheaper to rebuild it in a way? It, it would cost us probably cheaper to build a new building there than it would be to try to rehab this existing facility. You know, we, we did make sure we got this on our website several weeks ago, more than two weeks ago, so that you know people had a chance if they followed town business to follow it. In fact, I did receive from the, a call from the person who used to live there, uh, Jerry Murray, who supported its demolition. So, uh, who saw it? Uh, but no other feedback. No other feedback. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I was just curious what shade of white you'd chosen to paint the town hall. What shade of white? Just kidding. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Deborah is trying to model <laughs> color this evening. Sarah, I heard it was yellow. I, I am not a yellow fan. I'll admit it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any, Dave, we need a motion. Sure. Uh, I move that the town manager be authorized to uh, have the uh, structure located at 7 Holman Road uh, demolished. Second. I'll second. <laughs> Further discussion? Postmortem on the building? All those in favor? Can you tell us the day so we can observe? Yes. <laughs> when, the, when it's the dramatic? Well, seeing, <clears throat> seeing the firemen there would be the really exciting day. Yeah. Item 117, Townways Ordinance Draft Amendments. Mike? Yeah, I would defer it to the chair of the ordinance committee. Thank you. <laughs> so, so Unless he want, wants to bounce so, it back. So do we want to talk about the color of the building uh, before we get to this? No. Anyway, uh, this is a Townways Ordinance Amendment. This was uh, uh, essentially looking at the uh, 
the technical aspects of something that we all had to deal with when the Stonegate Road um, driveway permit was granted by the Public Works Director. And if you remember correctly, three of us had to recuse ourselves at the town council level uh, because it was brought to us as a sort of quasi-judicial body, which was a little bit out of the box. For those of us not attorneys, like uh, two, of, two of our uh, our colleagues, it was a little bit different. Um, so basically, we had two meetings. Um, it was uh, in the cover letter. You can see that Bob Malley was part of that discussion. So was Mike McGovern and Maureen O'Mara, as well as the three members of the council, uh, council's ordinance committee. Um, we basically reviewed the entire um, uh, ordinance, and you can see, you know, the, the sections that have been struck and new wording added. Um, and in, in effect, what we did is we took the town council out of the, the sort of uh, appeal process. So you have the director of public works granting permission, and then it would go to the zoning board of appeals if it had to be um, reviewed rather than to the town council. Um, it just cleaned up a lot of those pieces. There's also some, uh, some wording, some nomenclature that's used in this ordinance that was inappropriate. Um, like the, you know, there's a word geometry versus grade of driveway. These are things that are more consistent with what's being used universally in the business. And then finally, as part of our communication strategy, and one of the counselors here today asked us to do more of this, and that was Caitlin, we reached out for those constituents that had a direct um, interest in this particular um, ordinance, and in particular those individuals that were involved in the Stonegate uh, situation. And we did receive from one of those two parties some, some good feedback that was incorporated. So, so what you have in front of you is, uh, is a rather clean version that uh, we feel is workable. And I think uh, good work on the part of uh, Bob Malley, Maureen O'Mara, uh, Mike McGovern, and uh, the uh, three members of the Ordinance Committee recommend that you accept the change. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> is that a motion? Yes, it is. Second it. To refer to public hearing next month. Well, that's what it says on here, right? Sorry, just build in your motion. Okay, so make a motion, motion to motion refer is, it to public. Is to is to review the issues relating to town ordinance and refer a proposal for a, for a uh, public hearing on the 10th of September. Second. Further discussion. Jessica, I just had a, two questions. Yep. Um, is the zoning board of appeals the final recourse? Well, uh, like, like everything, <laughs> it can work first. There's no final. <laughs> it could wind up in the courts. If it, it, okay. If but, at the, but for the town the level. level. At that the town would, level, okay. yeah. And my other it just was an odd place to put us in this driveway permit process. Yeah. You know, it was kind of right over the sort of next step, and it cleaned it up. But again, you know, people in the end, as, as it turned out, this particular case wound up in court. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And just, I was just curious, um, the permit fee is not established by the council. Who then establishes it? Council always sets fees. That's so I'm curious what you're reading. Uh, section 17-2-3, it's um, under application. The, 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 uh, the words established by the town council were deleted, but I'm wondering if we just viewed that as a redundancy. Yeah. Council okay. sets all fees. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Um, as one of the people who had to decide this, I, I applaud this change. Jessica, just for the sake of the listening audience, do you, do you want to say the Zoning Board of Appeals? What, what, is that an appoint, done through appointments? Yes. And how many people are on it? And, I mean, I, I confess I don't even know this. And how, yep. how long are their terms? Do you know off so, the top of your head? Sorry. Sure. The Zoning Board of Appeals, um, are, uh, the members are appointed by the Appointment Committee, point, Appointments Committee, seven-member board, three-year ter staggered terms. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All those in favor, we're setting for public hearing. Thank you. Uh, item 118, Administrative Code Technical Amendments. Mike, do you want to say anything? Yeah, just this tries to just bring things into conformance with current practices. Two changes that, that show up in the draft. One is that the position of community services director, since it's now solely a school position, 
would no longer show up in the, the municipal administrative code. And secondly, the facilities manager, this provides it's appointed by the town manager since the facilities manager now is appointed by the superintendent of schools. It, uh, it is listed. The reason this still stayed in is because the community services director really doesn't have a responsibility to, mm -hmm. to, the, the, public, to the municipal side of government. The facilities manager does. So it's, it still is in there as a position. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I debated taking it out, but it's uh, decided to ought to win. The, the only other change would be once the community services position director positions out, we'd renumber this accordingly. Jim? Do, is there one of, is there something in the school board that is consistent with the change that you're making on the town side? I believe they probably, in, they approved new job descriptions. Yeah. And as they have made all of these shuffling in the last year with facilities and maintenance and whatever, yeah. uh, they've adopted new job descriptions. Uh, I guess we need a motion. Jessica? Um, actually, I had a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, was, I was looking at town engineer, and do we have one? Or is that an ad hoc appointment? or? No, it's exactly as, as is here, is we do have a town engineer uh, that has the statutory authority of things that are listed in the ordinance. Uh, the, the person is Steve Harding, uh, who works with AMEC. Okay. And, you know, we, we contract with them, and if... If we went to another firm, we'd, or if someone else, if Steve gave it up, we, we would have someone else do it from that firm. We, we had a discussion once of, he, he's gone up in the organization, has, he runs their office now, whether or not he was, it was still appropriate, but he still wanted the position. In fact, I just got an email from him this evening, so he stays on top of things. Well, like, but like me, he forgot to put the attachment. <laughs> He promised. Yeah, we, we do have a town engineer. Uh, Dave, you want to do a motion? Sure. I move that we refer the uh, proposed technical amendments to the administrative code uh, to a public hearing on Monday, September 10th at 7 p.m. Seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, item 119, compliance policy after issuance of bond. Yeah, th this I think is a boilerplate thing. The, the, the really good news is the auditors have already completed the audit. Uh, the only thing, reason it hasn't been released is still waiting for a couple of confirmations. Uh, and one of the things they're, they're recommending in the draft uh, management letter, or letter of reportable condition, whatever they call it, is that we have a post-issuance compliance policy relating to bonds issued by the town. So I asked them if they knew of a good one. They said the town of Cumberland had a good one. I wrote to Bill Shane, my counterpart over there, and he was nice enough to email me, and we replaced Cumberland with Cape Elizabeth, <laughs> and uh, recommend you adopt it. Questions for Mike? I give full credit to the town of Cumberland. Uh, <laughs> does anyone want to give a motion? I, I sure. move that, uh, that we accept the auditor's recommendation to adopt a policy for compliance with recommendations following issuance of bonds, the draft Cape Elizabeth policy um, attached to today's minutes. And give full credit to the Town of Cumberland for their initial work. <laughs> Second it. No further, any further conversation? All those in favor? Okay, lastly, item 120, goal to review fundraising policy. There's no action really on this. Um, it's just a summary that was prepared for us to review. Does anyone have questions, comments? Mike, do you want to say anything? No, I think it was just very interesting to dig out all the policies and to look at them. And my reaction was I, I think we've already addressed in the policy the issues that that caused this to be a council goal this year. Uh, it was concern about, I think, you know, when you pull it all together and you see it, I think uh, we, have, we have some fairly good policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and <clears throat> I might just uh, mention for the other counselors that the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation is a 501C3 uh, organization. <clears throat> 
I, I think another issue that maybe caused this to bubble to the surface was just a concern that with all these groups in town, all these bodies raising money, were we perhaps tapping out our citizens too much, I suppose. And it, it seems once we, Mike sort of organized all of this into one report, it, it seemed like there was a little bit more organization or uh, methods to the madness, if you will. So uh, I found it to be very re reassuring to read the report. And I think at the end of the day, uh, it's ultimately up to the citizens to decide what they're going to support if, if, or other donors, so. At many needs. Um, citizen opportunity for discussions on items not on the agenda, but seeing no citizens here. Jim, do you want to just yeah. announce publicly when the next ordinance committee meeting on short-term rentals is, since there may be interested folks? Yeah, the meeting was scheduled for tomorrow, because, I, but I have a personal issue, so we've um, postponed it to the 6th of September at 4 o'clock. September 6th? 6th at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock in the? And it'll be in the Jordan Conference Room. Conference Room. And um, all the materials are on the, um, actually on the website. The reason we moved it to that date is because we have a workshop scheduled that week for town okay. council, right? Yeah, I, I've got on my the, yeah, one calendar has the meeting on both the fifth and the sixth. So it was changed today. It's, it's, it's an overnight meeting. No. <laughs> Bring sleeping bags. It was originally scheduled for the fifth. Right. So it was did the one come out today? Was there intent to change it from the fifth? Yes, Maureen. Yes, it was. Maureen sent one today that changed it. Mary, she forgot to have a copy, maybe? Workshop. No, she did, is, but I'm the, wondering if she The reason she right changed thing. it was because it was going to bump up against the town council workshop that okay. evening. And rather than having the, the town ordinance committee go from four to six and then from seven to whenever, the feeling was to move the, the ordinance committee meeting till the sixth. Okay. And when we surveyed the committee, the sixth was available on our schedule. So just to be clear, it wasn't that the 5th and 6th, that the workshop on the 5th was related to that in any way in terms of no. topic, just so people are clear, we're no. not actually talking about short-term rentals at the 5th, the full town council workshop on the 5th. Right. It was just a scheduling issue. Yeah, it was. So the 6th, 4 p.m., next short-term rental. So the 5th needs to come off the calendar? Well, um, if, for the ordinance, but it But, but we have a workshop. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Any other comments, needs, blah, blah, before we adjourn? Okay, does anyone have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much.